The Silentium PC Grandis 3 Evo ARGB, arguably the most ARGB cooler on the market today only because people argue about weird things. But is it any good? Well, that's what this video is all about. So if you want to skip to any particular part of the video, please use the chapters, as they're known now, in the red timeline uh, at the bottom of this video, somewhere here, or use the timestamps as you used to call them, or I still guess call them, in the video description or first pinned comment. If you do like the video, please consider subscribing to see more in the future. And if you do like this cooler and you want to pick it up, then please consider using the Amazon and associate links in the video description. This channel does earn from those links. So thanks for checking this out and I'll catch you in a second to start with the unboxing, which I'm going to say in a second because that's how I scripted it. So apologies for that. We'll start at the logical first step, the unboxing. A brief look at the packaging establishes this is a CPU cooler and it has all sorts of specifications. Lovely. Moving past the sarcasm, the presentation for all it's worth is excellent. The tower is effectively and efficiently protected by the fans and accessories boxes with a small closed cell foam to protect the base plate. Top marks there. We'll start the overview with the tower and this thing is quite the monster. It measures in at 159mm tall and weighs around 1 kilos with the fans attached. It has a pretty popular U-shaped tower configuration like the Noctua NH series series coolers, but unlike much of the Noctua lineup, the Grandis 3 Evo ARGB is capped off with a matte finished top plate with heat pipe covers, which leaves it looking very stylish indeed. The Grandis 3 without the ARGB does the same. Opposing the top plate is the base plate, which clamps the six heat pipes that travel through it. It's a nickel plated copper base plate with a rather thick aluminium bracket on top for clamping it onto your motherboard. The base plate, as most are, is protected with an adhesive adhesively applied film. This of course needs removing before installation, and if you've got any sort of cleaning agent available to hand, such as isopropyl alcohol, I'd give it a rough clean to ensure maximum thermal conductivity. If you don't, it's not the end of the world, and probably won't make that much of a difference anyway, but you know, if you can. Why not? How about those fans? As you may have guessed, we've got two of them, and they're both part of Silentium PC's Pulsar range, which employ translucent plastic to transmit light from ARGB LEDs mounted in the core of the blades throughout the unit. Unfortunately, if you wanted to buy these individually, they're only available in a select few cases and CPU coolers, but who knows, this could change going forward. Compatibility-wise, you can take a quick look at their site to see what the ARGB lights are compatible with, board-wise. Both the fan speed and ARGB connectors can daisy-chain into each other, which is always a nice to have, and if you need, there is a converter from the universal ARGB connector style to the gigabyte connector style, the three pins next to each other. Before we cover the installation, we need some parts. The accessories box contains all the parts we need, including the mounting kit for various sockets, fan clips, thermal paste, and ARGB control unit in case you don't have a board that can support ARGB, or, or you just don't want to install the tedious software. Nobody would blame you. The manual is small and succinct, and all the included parts are presented and labeled to the top with the list of compatible sockets. Saves me listing them, much obliged. For the one or two people who comment asking, how do I get the lighting to work? They, I can't connect, how does it? You can download the manual online, which has the instructions instructions in case you missed them in the two-page manual, and I'll go through them in the setup in a second after we install the tower. Speaking of which, let's get onto that. For AMD boards, you need the backplate that comes with your board, but for Intel boards, such as the 1151 socket I've got here, you need to use the included backplate in addition to a set of spacers, screws, and a front bracket to form a mounting ring not something you need to add to your Google search history. If I were the nitpicking kind of person, and I am, then I'd mention this is very difficult to install on a vertically mounted board, such as installed into a case that's upright. So it really relies on the motherboard being horizontal and accessible from both sides. That means either outside of a case, which is normally how I'd go about it, or inside a case that's cantilevering over the edge of a desk to make sure you can stop the back plate from falling out. Maybe double side stick tape could work here. It's certainly nitpicking and something that counters that small bug is the ability to install the cooler horizontally or vertically without needing to rotate the mounting ring thanks to the holes on all sides. Adding the tower to the mounting ring, it, it just gets worse, only requires a couple of screws through the top bracket of the base plate, which requires noticeably less turns than the usual to bottom out. 
And now we can leave the awful euphemisms and complete the installation with the fans. The larger of the two, the 140mm fan, is designed to fit between the fin stacks of the tower, and the smaller 120mm fan goes towards the front. But realistically, they both use the same clips to the same position, so you could put the fans wherever you want if you're so inclined and you may be so inclined if you have tall RAM. These relatively mid-profile Ripjaws 5 sticks at 42mm tall barely allow the fan to fit under the top of the heat pipe caps, so any RAM that's taller than 42mm will force the fan above the rated height of the cooler and will at best look a bit off, or at worst might not fit inside the case you are planning to fit them into because that will go above the specification of the cooler. It is worth stating that the tower itself is clear of the RAM slot, but the fan at the front will cover three of them. However, there is always the option to move the 120mm fan to the rear to completely avoid this issue, or remove it entirely since I don't think it improves thermal performance much greater than testing tolerance. I have tested this previously with the dual fan Arctic Freezer 34 Esports Duo, and there really wasn't much difference thermally, but there was a significant increase in acoustic output when you ramp the fan speed up anyway. And besides, doesn't it look awesome enough with the central 140mm fan by itself? As promised, actually there was no promise, but I did say I'd cover the fan connections in more detail, so let's sort this out. Now, the manual isn't entirely clear on this, but there are two options. If you want to control the lighting via your motherboard with some software, then you simply connect the male end of one of the fan's ARGB 3-pin connectors to the female end of the other fan's ARGB connector, and then take the female ARGB connector of the first fan and connect it to the ARGB 3-pin header on your motherboard. If you've got a gigabyte board, you'll want to add the adapter between the board and the first fan's female connector. In truth, there's no real requirement to connect the fans in any particular order, but for the sake of instructions, I use the word first. If you're going to use the included controller to handle the lighting of these fans, instead of connecting the fans' ARGB connectors to each other and then straight to the board, you'll connect them to each other and then connect them to the included controller box. Out of the other end of the controller box, you've got two wires. To control the lighting modes, you'll use the reset button of your case, so instead of connecting the reset switch connector to your motherboard, you connect it into this oversized connector that comes out of the box. It's actually got two pins in there, but it's the size of a three pin one, but don't worry. Connect the two pins to the reset switch and you're all good. And to power the ARGB lights and the controller box, you take the other wire that comes out of the controller box and connect it to the SATA power connector from your power supply unit. Now when you turn on the system, the power supply unit will be sending power to your lights through the controller box, and then you press the reset button of your case, which will let the controller box know when to change the lighting modes. In terms of lighting modes available, you've got all sorts of single, dual, and multi-spiral effects, as well as a set of static modes, and you can always turn it off by holding down the reset button for a couple of seconds. I think it's worth stating that under studio lighting conditions, massive air quotes around that, the lighting effects to the frames are pretty bland. Personally, I'm not into explosions of lighting effects, so I'm perfectly happy with the more subtle glow, especially around the frame of the central fan, but if you really like your ARGB lighting and want an effect closer to that advertised with these fans, I'm calling BS on the renders by the way, not even close to the effect provided, especially when in a fully lit space, but if you work and play with the lights off, also don't google that, then the effect looks a lot bolder and much closer to what's advertised. I've cranked up the ISO in these shots up to like 5000 I think, to as accurately as I can replicate what I could see, I had some light coming through from the window hitting the whole system, but it was more of an evening light, and a little from my monitor that was mostly being blocked by the chassis. In this setting, it's genuinely striking and interesting to look at. Now, let's cover a little on the performance side of things. Normally, I'd go into extraneous detail since I pride my testing on being thorough, but rather than bore you with all the details, I'm going to summarize my findings and flag up the evidence in the background. Uh, on onto the uh, pride myself on, on more thorough and accurate testing. Now, I did have to do some additional testing on the Freezer 34 Esports Duo since the retest performed between its review and the change up in testing methodology had an inaccurate fan speed settings on the acoustically limited test, uh, the, the Fire Strike one. Just saying that to be as transparent as I can. So, how was the Grandis 3 Evo ARGB? 
At full fan speed, at an average of 1500 RPM, it was relatively quiet compared to most coolers, I'd say below average in terms of noise output. And thermally, with Priority 5 akin to a full load test at around 100 watt output from the 6700K, it didn't perform as well as the Freezer 34 Esports Duo or the Mugen 5. At a lower load, around 60 watts with Fire Strike, it performs about equally with the Freezer 34 Esports Duo, but still a ways behind the Mugen 5. In the acoustically limited testing, where all the coolest fans are tuned to output the same noise level, the Grandis 3 still isn't holding up to the Freezer 34 Esports Duo, and a ways off the pace of the Mugen 5 at 100 watts of load. And turning the heat back down to 60 watts reads about the same before, equal to the Freezer and a way off the Mugen 5. Looking at the prices of all these coolers, the Grandis 3 EVO ARGB is pretty up there in terms of cost. It's noticeably pricier than the Mugen 5 and Freezer 34 Esports Duo, so when we take a look at the price versus performance data, the Arctic 34 Esports Duo is looking like a better deal for a dual fan cooler. But if you're looking for outright cooling performance with an excellent value, then the Mugen 5 is about as good as you're going to get with relative performance to the NHD15S and Dark Rock 4. As tested with previous testing methodology. But none of that takes into account the ARGB feature of the Grandis 3 EVO ARGB, and you can get a non-ARGB version for £10 cheaper, which would bring the price versus performance close to that of the Mugen 5 and Freezer 34, the supports duo. But if you really want that dual ARGB style, well, it's about as good as you can get on the market regarding price and performance. So there we have it. Uh, initially, uh, when I first saw the results from the testing and I compared it to the price and price versus performance along with that, with the, with the, uh, well, the Arctic Freezer 34 Esports Duo and the Mugen 5, which is my test cooler, I, I was pretty disappointed and I thought this really isn't um, that great value for money. But the problem is, is that comparing it you know, one to one with coolers that don't have the ARGB element, especially implemented to such a extreme degree as it is in this uh, this CPU cooler, it, it really is a false economy to compare them directly. So you have to compare it to the rest of the market and um, for like feature parity, as it were. Um, if that's the right term. But when you compare it with the rest of the market, which are dual fan coolers with ARGB fans, then it does favor pretty well. So if you're looking for ARGB dual tower and dual fan coolers, then this is really the one to look out for. It performs beautifully as far as I'm concerned uh, in that ballpark and the price is reasonable as well. So it really is worth picking up uh, or considering picking up uh, if you're in the market, that sort of thing. Uh, I am really impressed overall with the quality. The build quality is good. The installation was really solid. And um, that's some of the th key things that I look for is just an intuitive and sensible approach to the installation and mounting. Uh, and the, the amount of rotations to the hold down screws was uh, a lot less than usual. It's not really fine thread. Fine threads do uh, allow for more holding force, but you don't really need a lot of holding force to begin with anyway. So, um, there was always that to consider, but yeah, really, really intuitive and strong mounting uh, solution, uh, really nice build quality, and the finish, the fit and finish is really nice compared to something like your NHD15S, uh, or D15 generally, which is the dual fan version, um, yeah, that, that just looks pretty terrible uh, in, in comparison when we're talking about the quality of the finish uh, you know, alone, so apart from that, uh, I think it's an excellent cooler and definitely one worth considering, and I would recommend checking it out. So, thanks for checking this one out, and uh, one thing I will be doing in the future, but not now, is I will be including patrons who support me on Patreon, uh, and I'll be doing some sort of credit sequence. I haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to do it, but I will in some shape or form be including them in the ending 20 second credits or ending 20 second card things that I show up here. Um, so to, to give them um, some, what's the right word? Recognition. To give them some recognition for the support they give the channel. And I did actually have to search for a synonym of credit to find out what that was. But anyway, I will be doing that in the future. So thanks to all you guys who do support me on Patreon. Uh, every little helps, genuinely does, uh, and yeah, I appreciate that. So, 
If you want to check out more, again, consider subscribing, and I will catch you in the future for more CPU cooler reviews and PC case reviews, along with the odd system kind of build and advice sort of thing thrown in every now and then. And if you haven't actually checked it out, please consider checking out the massive graphics card price breakdown thing that I've done of the entire market in the EU, UK, and the US. But this has gone on for way too long, so thanks for checking this out, and I'll catch you in the next one.